Tonight we'll be... Oh, Charlie, Charlie showed up. Look at that. Tonight we'll be in Hebrews. And... Uh, I think it's chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. I didn't delete you on Facebook. Well, I guess you were here. I didn't delete anyone in our church on Facebook today. But it was very telling. I went from 5,000 to 300. I just... I developed. I did delete my grandma by accident. <laughs> Didn't mean to delete her. There, you know, people set up fake accounts, and then you know, grandmas always lose. Like grandma, Melissa's grandma had like three accounts, three Facebook. I, I deleted two of them. I hope I deleted the right two. Of Melissa's grandma. I might delete Melissa's grandma too. But uh, you know, elderly people lose their passwords, and so they just start new accounts. And then also, people fake their account and try to you know, get you to send them money or whatever and uh, pray on elderly people that way. Hebrews chapter 8. So I had a lot of standards for who I deleted. If I didn't instantly recognize you, which is, you know, <laughs> that's why I only have 300 friends left. <laughs> because of my memory, you know. Uh, but like if I don't know who you are just right away, I deleted you. If I didn't like your profile picture, I deleted you. Um, if we didn't cup our our, uh, our mouths to the water, like, like a giant <laughs> yeah, like, Gideon. It was like a Gideon thing, you know. Just left me like 180, you know. <laughs> so I went from 5,000 to 308. 308 is good caliber. So, all right. That has nothing to do with anything. It's just been on my mind today. I feel like like a clean house. I need to do that. And my Melissa's like, I wish you delete your garage. <laughs> Hopefully. If I haven't used you in the last week, you're gone. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle with the, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make that tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them up out of the land of Egypt. And we'll stop there. That's quite a bit, isn't it? So, Father, I pray that you would just help us this evening as we follow this uh, flow of thought where we really kind of summarize the reality that Jesus is a better high priest and he's in a better place offering better sacrifices for a better covenant. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you follow the flow of thought from... Hebrews chapter 5 and 6 uh, uh, and 7, you'd remember, you know, that we began by the mention of Melchizedek with a little excursion and warning uh, in, in chapter 6, beginning with the warning, first of all, or with the reality that many of the things that are going to be explained about Melchizedek are too hard to be understood because of the mental immaturity or the spiritual immaturity of the believers. And truly, Hebrews is a fascinating book to a growing believer, isn't it? Hebrews is a fascinating book to somebody who's trying to understand the heartbeat, the throb of God's heart, and know how God thinks, and know uh, what what it's like on the other side when we pray to God, when we, when we talk to God. You ever just wonder? Like, you know, your circumstances that you pray from, but what's God coming from? You ever just get a phone call from someone and you can just tell there's a lot going on in the background. It's, I, I uh, use my cell phone for all of our church phone calls. So it's always interesting where I'll be at sometimes when somebody calls for 
to, to either inquire about our church or they call about a question or they call about different things. I've a lot of times got background noises. Sometimes you'll call a home and you can tell there's kids there because, you know, it just sounds like people are napping. Um, <laughs> sometimes you can call a house and, or you call a place and you can tell, boy, it's a construction zone. I called a pastor some years ago, and I mean, it was just banging and hammering, jackhammering. I said, I'll call you back later. You know, you may, I may be able to hear you, but you can't hear me with all the background. But you ever just wonder, though, when you're talking to God, what are the circumstances where he's at? Now, we've got a few of those descriptions, don't we? Isaiah's description in chapter 6 of Isaiah, where, you know, you just have this earth not really earth-shaking, but heaven-shaking uh, throne room, then the temple where God is at <coughs> is a pretty good description. John's description in Revelation, when he sees into the throne room of God, and he describes it. And it's interesting, Isaiah and John both pretty much describe the same thing. And one of the things that we take away, of course, is the distance that God has removed from us, that He's high and lifted up, and one of the things that we take away is the holiness yeah, where we literally fall on our faces. But what has altered the throne room of God from the description in Isaiah 6 to the description in John chapter 1 is what Jesus Christ has done in the working of a, as a high priest. Ever think on that? The throne room of God's always, I think, I don't think God's been building the throne room. Uh, he's been making mansions in his in Jesus said in his father's house. He's been making places for us there. But the throne room of God's it's an established place and it's not going to be destroyed and rebuilt. But it's changed. The throne room of God has changed because of the work of the cross. Can you imagine what it must have been like for all those years to have an altar in the throne room for sacrifice, for blood to be offered? Unused. No blood offered on it. For a once-for-all sacrifice. Blood that can only be shed one time. Last week we saw in chapter 6, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify. Christ afresh and put into an open shame. And it's a once for all sacrifice and we'll see more of that. But the beauty of this portion of Hebrews is now we're getting a description of what it's like in heaven. What Jesus is there doing on our behalf. And we begin chapter 7 by hearing the sum or summary of the things. And so everything all added up is, is uh, really begin to be described. And so if you would see in the order of <coughs> this letter to the Hebrew believers who are being encouraged to go forward in their faith, to, to not quit, to not fall back. What we see here is that we're going to begin to see the application of all the things that we've learned so far. What have we learned? Well, we learned that Jesus Christ is better than the angels and the position that He's given us as children, as His, as His brethren, is higher than the angels. And so don't go back to a religion that worships angels. We're warned that God's judgment for the angels was steadfast. And so if the angels can't escape God's wrath, don't think that you could either. Don't think that those in Judaism can escape God's wrath. See, isn't that kind of the, isn't that kind of the rub of religion without Jesus? Sometimes I ask myself the question, why bother with a religion that probably most of its proponents don't believe is true? You think Roman Catholic priests think that Catholicism is the way to Christ? Some of them maybe, but most don't. I've met with enough Catholic priests to know they're fakes. Most of them actually know that Catholicism isn't, it's, it's full of lies. It's just a religion. Uh, Judaism. Do you think the Jews really don't know the Messiah came? I don't know when the last time I met a Jew that was looking for a Messiah, but there are very few Jews who are not born again, who are looking for the Messiah. What's the attraction in a religion that has no, has no Savior? What's the attraction in a religion that is otherwise from the truth? 
I think that sometimes people think, well, it's close enough that it's going to just, it's going to create enough confusion that God won't know what to do with it. I'm serious about it, though. If you think about it, you talk to people. I mean, people really are taking a major risk, are they not? In Catholicism, and well, I'll tell you, it's, it's pretty close, isn't it? You, you take what a lot of people believe, and it's pretty close. So a lot, there's a lot there that's the truth. It's, just, it's more what you add than what's not there. It's pretty close. And I think a lot of times the people in the in that belief system think, well, you know, I probably am going to make it, even if it's by the skin of my teeth. I'm probably going to make it because it's pretty close. And the Hebrew believers are warned. You go back into Judaism. Just remember this. When God cast the angels out of heaven, He didn't allow for them to come back. Their judgment was steadfast. God doesn't play. And you better not play either. It's a pretty stern warning. That's the warning. Then we saw the comparison, of course, with Moses. Moses was faithful in all his house, but Moses didn't enter into rest. You go back to Moses, if you're going to depend on Moses, again, it's that kind of, we're pretty close, right? Moses was a believer. You know, we're identifying with Moses. Moses didn't enter into rest, and you better watch out. Because the religion you're going into, they will not enter into rest. Their carcasses will drop off, just like the children of Israel dropped off in the wilderness and they never went into the promised land. That religion is not going to be in heaven. False religion won't be in the heaven. Look out. Watch out. You see it? We see the priests. You know, we're going to go back into the Levitical priest system. We're going to go back under the law. Hebrews, this letter is not bashing God's law, but it is certainly showing that the law can't save. That the law doesn't give eternal life. And that really is what the conclusion of chapter 6 and 7 comes out to. Look back in chapter 7, will you please? I just want to read through some things. Uh, in verse 8, we've, we've, looked up to, we've, we've looked all the way through this part in the past, and I can't review it. But verse 8, Here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes, tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now here's the, here's the concluding argument for this. If therefore for perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. You see this? In other words, what we have is better than the law. We're going to be talking about the law now. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is also made of necessity a change also of the law. So there's a change. You can't keep the law. And if the priesthood is changed, the law is also changed. And uh, friend, you can go back under the Levitical priesthood, but can I say to you, it's no longer valid. <clears throat> it's not valid anymore. And you can go back to the law, but the law is not law. It's, it's, it doesn't have jurisdiction anymore. Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law. Now, notice the eternal ramifications. Now, in verse 14, For it's evident that our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So Jesus is not Le Levite. Isn't it great? Isn't it wonderful that Jesus wasn't born from the tribe of Levi? You used to always say, wonder why Jesus wasn't born of Levi. Well, Hebrews explains it. Because Jesus is superior to Levitical priesthood. He's superior to the law. He's greater than that. Mm -hmm. Just like Abraham offering tithes to Melchizedek showed that Melchizedek or another priesthood was greater than Aaron because in his loins was... The, was the Levitical priesthood. Jesus is greater than that. It's better than that. And then again we see that, that the same quote from Psalm 110, for he testifieth thou art a priest forever after the order of uh, Melchizedek. Now, verse 18. Uh, this is one of the things I wanted just to, to build up to, to in our text tonight. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weaknesses and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And now here we're kind of uh, being brought in our flow of thought, not just from the fear place, but from the 
fact that, do you remember what happened when the children of Israel were at Mount, were at Mount Sinai and the, and the mountain was smoking? Do you remember that? What was the response of the people when God was on the mountain and the mountain was literally smoking <coughs> with God's glory? Don't let God speak to us directly. Speak through Moses. Yeah. Don't let God talk to us. Moses, you talk to God, and whatever God tells you, we'll do. That mount's where God gave His law, and the law created more separation, didn't it? You ever, you ever been wronged by somebody and try to find them and talk to them? Do they answer the phone? Do they answer the door? What do people act like when they've wronged someone? Uh, guilty, right? Guilty people don't want to talk. Uh, you, can, you can be trying to talk to them, trying to reconcile with them, but if they've wronged you, they don't want anything to do with you. Isn't that ironic? But what are people like who have broken God's law? They want to be in His presence? They want to come before Him? They want to be as far away from God as they can be. And the contrast here is that the law, the law distanced people because it showed sin. It showed what we are, and it made us separate from God, not near God. But the cross, I love this, and it made us want to draw nigh to God. Once you come to the cross of Jesus Christ, my friend, once you know forgiveness for sin, then all of a sudden, you don't know anything about God's wrath anymore. God's wrath isn't directed towards you. God's not angry with you. And now you know a father who loves his children and desires to answer prayer and give victory to them and to do good things for them and bless them. You know a father who there's no doubt or question about his love or his devotion to you. You can't doubt God's love. He gave His Son. And so now uh, the, the contrast is that in verse 19, the bringing in of a better hope did make things perfect by the which we draw nigh unto God. So the difference between the law and Jesus is that the law separates men from God or shows men or emphasizes the separation. But Jesus gives us a hope and make, breaks us, brings us near to God. Instead of being separate, we can walk up onto the mountain today. You ever think on that? We can walk up on the mountain today. Even if God were there. Listen. Is that astonishing? If God were on the mountaintop, we could go up it because of Jesus. And so, Jesus is in every way superior. Jesus is in every way better than anything that you could go back into regarding dead religion. <clears throat> and inasmuch as not without an oath, He was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath. What's an oath? Well, an oath is a solemn promise. Jesus was made a priest with a promise. And again, we see this, this oath being sworn, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we don't use terminology like oaths too much today, do we? Usually we're thinking of court of law, don't we? And, but what is the major danger uh, under oath? What's the major danger when you're under oath? If you break it, there's punishment. Perjury. Yeah, the danger of an oath is perjury. And so we see imperfect men are made imperfect priests to offer imperfect sacrifices. But God's perfect Son was made with an oath, a priest, after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, he's not Levitical. But an oath is a promise, a solemn promise. And God's not going to perjure himself. That's the kind of priest we have. It's not like there's something's going to change. And the Mormons have it wrong. God didn't change His mind about salvation. He didn't develop something new. Catholicism today, where they're changing, they've got it wrong. God doesn't change. And there's not going to be the next level of God working with men. There's not going to be the next dispensation, if you will beyond what we see in the Revelation. God swore with an oath and Jesus Christ was made priest. And my friend, God's Word makes Jesus more legitimate 
do you see, than any Levitical priest could be. Boy, you ought to be on Sunday nights as we're studying. We, uh, you've missed out if you haven't been as we looked at Samuel and, and uh, Levi and looked at, at or not Levi, Eli. I always mix those names in my mind. I think it's my list exia. But the, is, uh, the, as we've been studying and looking at those guys, we have been uh, really seeing, you know, here Eli is a good, good man, a good priest, and he's really does a good job with Samuel, but his sons turn out terrible. And then Samuel, I mean, Samuel was probably Israel's best priest. He was a judge and a priest, and he was probably the best priest Israel ever had. And his sons turned out terrible, and his, his sons couldn't even be priests. They were, they were just like Levi's sons. Then Jesus. <coughs> Do you see the contrast? Listen, I'm sure, I'm sure in the courtyards, on the rooftops, in the, in the city uh, gates, conversation went around in hushed tones about indiscretions of the Levitical priests. <coughs> the fact is, any man that represents God is a failure. I'm not justifying. I'm not saying that's okay. But what I'm saying is that there's a big difference between Jesus being our high priest, sworn with an oath, and, any, and the best of the Levitical priests. The best of them. And there are some good ones. Now, let's look at the eternal nature. Would you look at verse 23? And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered, that means to be allowed, to continue by reason of death. Okay, so there's more than one of them. Why? Why didn't we, why didn't we just have Aaron? Well, because they died. And, of course, the innuendo there is what? Yeah, they died because they're sinners. They're imperfect. Yeah, you guys are smart. I don't need to teach this. Verse 25, wherefore he's able... Oh, I'm sorry, verse 24. But this man, this is Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. There's not going to be version, you know, whatever point O priest. Jesus is the once for all priest. He's the priest that was sitting in the presence of God when the letter to the Hebrews was authored. And he's the priest that's sitting in the presence of God at this very minute. He hath an unchangeable priesthood. Verse 25, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. You notice that word, uttermost? I love the phrase, he is able to save them to the uttermost. But what's astonishing about it is the degree that it is describing. Completely save. Finally save. Perfectly save. Holy save. It's not this come in, come, come back again, see you next week. It's one and done. Save to the uttermost that come to under God by Him. And I love this. Seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Mm. He's still alive. And He's still making intercession. That's the kind of priest that we have. That's our high priest. That's the status that we have with God. So any individual that would go back to a system with a priest who is made without an oath by God, who is imperfect, who dies, it's a ridiculous comparison, isn't it? Instead of having a priest in the throne room of God who ever liveth to make intercession, for me, who is superior than the, to the angels or Moses or Aaron or any other priest, let me go back into this religion because that's what makes me comfortable. And here we have exposed the utter ridiculousness of going away from following Jesus. And you know, friend, we need that, we need that picture. We need that contrast ourselves, don't we? Well, 
you know, I just don't feel like going forward in my faith. Or I just, you know, I just... Do you see how utterly ridiculous it is? You don't have something to go back to that's better. You don't have something to go away from that's anything like what you have. The sweetest thing we have is a relationship with God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless. Hey, d don't minimize the importance of the word order here. When I think holy, I think dangerous. Don't you? Okay, so God in His holiness <clears throat> becomes the very opposite of everything that I am in my flesh. And that makes Him very dangerous to me, doesn't it? Holy, harmless. Why in the world would the Holy Spirit use a word like harmless to describe God's Son? Well, because to the wicked, he's very dangerous. When he comes back on his white horse, my friend, when he comes back with a rod of iron, he's going to speak, and every enemy that has brought themselves out in rebellion against him will be not just annihilated, but literally destroyed to the event that blood flows. God's holiness is dangerous. But when Jesus is your high priest sworn with an oath in heaven by God, his attitude toward us is harmless. Again, there do you see the contrast of the picture? The smoking mountain and a bunch of yay who's like us walking up it with no with no concern. Why? Because that's what Jesus Christ as our high priest has done for us. That's what he's made God to be for us. It's incredible, isn't it? For the law, oh, I'm sorry, and then, and then he, he's, we'll see this more in chapter 10, but who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once when he offered up himself. When did Jesus offer a sacrifice for his sins? Well, he never did. Didn't need to. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. Infirmity is weakness. Infirmity is sinfulness. But the word of oath, which was since the law maketh the Son, who is consecrated, or I'm sorry, but the word of oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Okay. I can't spend enough time here. But do you notice that the word oath, <coughs> the phrase, the word of oath, comes up a great deal here. That's a significant doctrine with regard to the difference between Jesus, our high priest, and the other priests that were taken from among men, the Levitical priests. Again, it's, it comes back to that word of promise from God which cannot be broken. And that's what is prophesied in Psalms, in the Psalms. Verse 1 of chapter 8. Now of the things which we have spoken... This is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of, of the majesty in the heavens. A minister, that the word means servant, a servant, if you will, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, we'll see the contrast that Moses had to pitch the first tabernacle. Um, for, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Okay, so if a priest has to offer something, well, he has to have something to offer too. But it's different. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. He wouldn't need to be a priest if he were on earth because there are individuals offering those things. But what they're offering is not real. It is a picture. Now, we're going to see this in chapter 10. Look up for just a minute. We're going to see this in chapter 9 and chapter 10 later on, but we're going to see the shadow of things to come. We're going to see the idea of the shadow is, of course, you know, that, that is the law is an illustration, but there's an underlying deeper truth. So when a lamb is offered, 
and not to be patronized or condescending. But when a lamb is offered, that's a shadow or a picture of what underlying truth? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Thanks, Josiah. You guys are scaring me for a minute. Okay, so a lamb, Jesus is the lamb, right? So the lamb is a shadow. A goat is a shadow. Uh, all the offerings are pictures. They're all pictures. But Jesus Christ is what they were an unclear picture of. If you have vision like me, you can understand a shadow with a better illustration uh, than what I than uh, what you get. I, I'm minus 700 in both of my eyes, and so without my contacts, I I don't know how blind bats are, but uh, <laughs> they can at least make sounds and and uh, avoid objects. I don't. My wife will tell you, and she worries about any obstacle at nighttime. Uh, being she makes sure you know everything doors are open all the way pictures are not on the wall you know she she literally like uh, uh, husband proofs the house <laughs> when I don't have glasses on because when I hit things I don't just hit them it just seems like I hit them with a couple hundred pounds of force and uh, I'm, and the, the thing that I say is who what I say baby who put that there or why is that yeah who put that there why is that there that sort of thing uh, but I understand if I didn't have my if I didn't have my contacts in this evening, I could pretty much tell who you are because of your shapes. Now, if y'all dieted or something like that, you could throw me off. <laughs> I, could, I could pretty much tell you know by shapes and sizes. I could tell who you are, but I couldn't make out your facial features at all, actually. And if you found someone with a similar shape to sit in your seat, you could fool me. You could get subs. If, if, if uh, I have bad vision sometime, you know, you could send a sub to church as long as they have a similar shape and wear your shirt or something. <laughs> but, you know, I can tell colors and shapes, but it's just a shadow. Well, that's what the law is. Now, get this. Don't, don't, don't gloss over this. There are people that think that in the Old Testament, the people didn't have a clue what the sacrifices represented, and that's just ridiculous. They absolutely know what the sacrifices represent. Represented. There are people who think, well, you know what, they didn't know, they didn't have the notion that the Messiah was going to die for sin. No, absolutely they knew that the Messiah was going to die for sin. Uh, Daniel 9, so clear about that. Isaiah 53, so clear about that. Psalm 22, so clear about that. You know, they knew. But they didn't have all the details. It was something that was going to happen in the future. It was somebody they'd never met. And now we have the vivid, vivid, crisp reality that Jesus is the fulfilling of all the things that were just a shadow. You could, they were just a blurred, uh, just a blurred picture. And so we see in verse 5, you say, Pastor, you're almost done? No, but we're going to have to be. Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. What, what's the pattern? Well, the pattern is a picture, of course, of the real thing. And then in verse 6, But now hath he obtained a much more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, if you're taking notes and leaving it in your Bible and you write cross-references in, this is Jeremiah chapter 31 that's being referenced. And I want to read that passage as we conclude this evening. Jeremiah chapter 31. I'm going to look down at verse 27. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. <coughs> In those days they shall say no more. You've seen this phrase before. The fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. You know what that is, right? Okay, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity, 
Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which by covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them and the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sin no more. And so this is the covenant that Jesus ultimately will fulfill. Now, Jesus has fulfilled the sacrifice, the remembering the iniquity no more. But today, people have to be taught, don't they? This is who the Lord is. Because the day is coming when there's not going to be anyone. And He's talking about Christ's kingdom when, Jesus, when we're actually with the Lord Jesus. When there's not going to be any more individuals who stray away from the Lord. Everyone's going to have a perfect heart toward God. And God is going to have a perfect attitude toward us because we'll have no iniquity. We'll have, uh, we will, he will remember our iniquity no more. Friend, that's the hope that's in Christ Jesus. What's the hope that's in religion? In Judaism. That's the hope that's in our high priest. What's the hope in the Levitical priest? That's the hope that's in Jesus. What's the hope that's in Moses' law? That's the hope that's in Jesus. Where is the hope in an angel? And so that is the beginning of the summary of the ramifications of who Jesus Christ is because of who Jesus Christ is. And can I say to you, my friend, that there's no reason to wander. There's no way, reason to doubt. There's no reason to go back away from Jesus because you'll never find anything as good. You'll never find anything that is not pale with comparison, that does not fall vastly short in comparison with our Savior who was made a priest with an oath. Thank you, Father, for what we've learned tonight. God, I pray that You would grant us more understanding. Help us to be individuals who could be teachers because of our understanding and not have need to be taught. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a lot there, isn't there? And, you know, I, I'm glad that hopefully I'll get to preach Hebrews for the rest of my life, not in this particular series. But there's just so much there that uh, I hope that it makes you hungry, gives you an appetite to go home and say, i got to read that. I had I to meditate on that. i got to think about that. And it'll be amazing what God will do in your heart if you'll do that. Let's take some prayer requests tonight.